So, willkommen. Welcome. And bienvenue to the Goethe Centrum Atlanta with the Aspen Institute Germany for a discussion on future cities, a transatlantic transatlantic town hall project. My name is Oliver Gorf and I'm the director of the Goethe Centrum Atlanta, the German part of the Franco-German Cultural Center in Atlanta, one of only three officially recognized Franco-German cultural institutes in the world. <laughs> one is in Palestine and the other one in Italy. And there will be more. <laughs> and maybe that's also, I also want to welcome our listeners in Los Angeles. Und hallo Berlin! Um, I'm looking forward to a very interesting discussion. We already had a little workshop in the morning and as a former middle school, public school teacher and university professor, I have to say it was really interesting to talk about the future of the city in connection with the youth. And let me just say this, I'm a fan of Gen Z. And we all should make them integrated in our lives. I want to welcome here at the panel today, um, Paige Alexander, the CEO of the Carter Center. I welcome Clyde Hicks, president and CEO of the Atlanta Beltline. The Beltline for the Berlin and LA audience is where Atlanta walks oh, comes <laughs> and comes together, exactly. Vanessa Ibarra, Executive Director of the Mayor's Office of International and Immigrant Affairs, the City of Atlanta. <laughs> and Anna Roach, Executive Director and CEO of Atlanta Regional Commission. <laughs> and of course, as our moderator, but not only, the organizer from the Aspen Institute, Stormy Annika Mildner, the executive director of the Aspen Institute Germany. Welcome all of you, and especially our audience here, our cultural programming, our additions to the civic debate in Atlanta and the southeast of America might be of interest for you. We're looking forward to work with all of you. And now I give the word to Stormy Annika Mildner. Well, thank you so much and thank you for hosting us. Um, I couldn't think about a better place to be here today. Um, and, uh, and you have been wonderful in organizing and putting everything together. So a big shout out um, to you and your team. And thank you so very, very much. <laughs> So the Aspen Institute Germany is all about fostering um, in international cooperation um, on a global level and a local level to contribute to solving um, or trying to solve some of the biggest challenges we are currently facing. Um, and we try to work uh, towards societies that are just, inclusive, sustainable, open, and which empower people. And we do that in very different fields, from digitalization to trade policies to energy and climate policies. And one of the areas which we are also focusing on are cities. And uh, we do so because cities are, so to say, the laboratories of our democracies. Um, and they can be that in a very good way, but they can also be that in a bad way. Um, and we want to foster the good ways. Um, and how we try to do this is by bringing together different stakeholders from both sides of the Atlantic. And we've been doing so in our transatlantic town hall project, uh, which we have been conducting over the last um, a little bit more than a year um, with lots of digital meetings because you can't fly everybody around the world all the time, would also not be sustainable, but also some physical meetings um, in Berlin, in Los Angeles, and now in Atlanta. 
And um, maybe I can ask the participants of our projects, a uh, project who have been working with us for more than a year, maybe to briefly stand up so that everybody sees them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And they have been working on also scenarios how the city, the good one, the bad one, and the so-so city could look like um, in, uh, <laughs> in, in about 15 years' time um, to, to derive policy um, policy actions and recommendations from where we can get to the good and to avoid um, the bad. And today um, we want to talk specifically about the issue of engagement, um, how to make cities more responsive and responsible and to get everybody on the table to really make good policies. And in our workshop this morning we heard that it all starts with the policies um, and if they are bad they can have a long last lasting, decades long bad effect, but if they are really good, they can also have a massively good effect. We also learned that um, uh, to have good policies, everybody needs to be involved and around the table, but how do you do that in an inclusive way, not to leave anybody out, not to shut anybody out? How do you, how do you organize this? Um, we also learned um, that we need to include the youth in this process. Um, we also learned that there are many different um, issue areas which need to be considered so that we get out of the silo thinking and the sectoral thinking. So, so health has a lot to do with transportation and health and transportation is so important to also think about education and education is so important about civic engagement and um, you know it all comes together but where do you start if you have so much to do and where do you get the money from to do so? Uh, you want to lower taxes on one hand side to bring in business to the cities but then you need the government budget to finance the programs, then you want to have public-private partnerships, so what's the responsibility of the business sector with the government sector together? Um, you don't want to push responsibilities from one to the other so that it's just been turned around and around and nothing happens. You don't want to do shadow boxing or light screening, you really want to get the policies to the people. So these are huge, huge challenges I think all of our three cities are facing today. Berlin. Um, Atlanta and Los Angeles with maybe different dimensions, but they are all there. Um, and um, I would love to start with you, Vanessa, um, and tell us a little about, but uh, you're responsible for the local and for the international. So how do you reconcile this? Um, how do you get that all together? Whew. All right, so there's a lot of different factors to consider. And so you mentioned, how do we do it? Because traditionally, when you're thinking about diplomacy, you're thinking about a country speaking to another country. And now what we're seeing more is city diplomacy really taking the lead. I always like to say that mayors, governors, and many various agency representatives are the new diplomats. They're the ones that are going directly and having conversations. So for example, Mayor Dickens can very well go have a conversation with the mayor of Berlin. He can have conversations with the mayor of Dusseldorf. He can have conversations with the ambassadors directly because we are the ones that are really seeing what is happening on the local level. So if we're talking about pandemic, if we're talking about youth, if we're talking about policy, if we're talking about food access, transportation, climate change, sustainability, we are the ones that are really seeing it on the ground. And so how do we do that at the Office of International Affairs? I've had the opportunity of being with the city now for three administrations. And something that I realized when talking to various, we welcome about, we've welcomed since the establishment of, of the office in 2013, over a thousand delegations. And so when I say a thousand delegations, they're interested in an array of different topics. But what I realized is, despite of our geographic location, the challenges are always the same. And so we started focusing more on the local level. And as you all may have heard, our office merged with the Office of Immigrant Affairs about eight months ago or so. And the reason being is, we're talking about diplomacy, we're talking about international business, connectivity, but what are we doing on the ground to build that relationship with the constituents we serve? And in the language that they understand as well. So we have I Speak ATL, My City ATL, we have community resource events, and what we've been focused on is building that bridge between City Hall and the communities we serve, because we do have the second fastest foreign-born population in the nation, and it is growing, and it is very dynamic, and how do we make sure that everybody feels heard, but also on the flip side, how do we have our constituents also understand the importance of diplomacy, of being globally connected? A lot of our youth, as we're talking, they're not gonna have the opportunity to be able to study abroad. So we focused on is bringing the global peace to Atlanta through various experiences, 
and youth and educational opportunities. So a lot to cover, but in a way, this is how we've been structuring everything through sports, youth, and just the human factor. At the end of the day is people can relate to one another on a human level, and that's what we're exploring. Could you maybe give us an example so that we understand better how you actually do it? So one example I can just talk about, and this is something that I learned, because I think it's key to always learn, the community resource events. Originally, they were being considered more of a food distribution. But what we came to realize is that the folks that are coming through, and something that we talked about during the workshop today, is access to information. So we partner with various organizations to provide food, but we also provide, we connect with health pro healthcare providers. We connect with folks that are able to talk to people about domestic violence. We have the opportunity also to talk about youth employment opportunities through the year of the youth. Or for example, we just had a legal clinic not long ago to provide the opportunity for folks to understand what it means to be involved in city government, but also to understand what resources are out there. Because oftentimes we're talking about the digital divide, right? We can post on social media, we can have our monthly newsletters, we can do media coverage, but perhaps a lot of folks, they use their phones sometimes just to call, right? They're not looking into this. And some people don't know how to navigate the internet. So we are there to say, here is an actual human being that is going to listen to you, to your needs. And so we've been doing this and we've probably done, we've served over 50 countries that have the access to this type of um, information and thousands and thousands of families that have benefited from this program. Thank you so much uh, for sharing this, is this example. Um, Paige, the um, health crisis, COVID, put a spotlight on many problems, which in a sense is a good way because it does put or did put the spotlight there. Um, how uh, marginalized communities did not have access to education, to health, to transportation. Um, and now that the pandemic is um, kind of over, um, what are the lessons learned from this? And um, how is the, has actually, have, have things changed in a lasting way? Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, Vanessa was talking about access to information and the Carter Center has spent over 25 years working on access to information. And about 10 years ago, Laura Newman realized that it was women that were having the most difficulty getting that access to information. So you add COVID onto that and women who have been part of domestic violence, are stuck at home in a situation that they can't get out of because of the COVID situation. But there are municipal services in many cities. And so this is why we uh, began something called Inform Women Transform Lives. And we partnered with Atlanta and 23 other global cities around the world to bring the municipal services that are provided directly to the citizens, and especially in this case, women because women are not getting the information and the intersectionality of adding that to you know, age, uh, you know, cultural norms, their inability to actually get out of the house, that was causing problems. So we've had a lot of successes and I look, you know, I'm thinking one of them uh, unrelated to Inform Women Transform Lives, but in Bangladesh, one of the things we had wanted to do was reach out and make sure we did a gender workshop. But in the middle of COVID, it was too hard to do because we couldn't travel. However, we met youth where they are in the digital space and we did these training services online. They used WhatsApp. They were able to do it without us showing up. And in other cases where we had this partnership with cities, once COVID broke a little bit, we were able to figure out from citizens exactly where the pulse was, what they needed. And people had a lot of time to reflect during COVID. And a lot of women came back and youth came back and said, you know, we need health services, but we don't know where to find them. And when the city said, well, we offer in Guatemala, Guatemala City, they said, we offer free health services. There was a 86% uptick in the use of the free health services. Or in Nairobi, in Kenya, where we were working, there was a domestic violence hotline. Only 10 people were calling a month. It went up to 500 calls once we partnered with the city and the city was able to communicate out. So communication, as Vanessa said, is really so much a part of this and getting to people and the citizens directly in the cities is going to be what builds the trust and what makes this available to everybody. 
And a follow-up question. You told us a little bit about examples around the world. Um, and did you take anything from your experiences there back to Atlanta? I, I would say more, more appropriately, Atlanta took their experiences overseas. You know, we have worked in international development at the Carter Center for over 40 years. And I arrived in 2020 in Atlanta, and I had been living in Europe. And so to get back to Atlanta and see the city that it had become, I left in the 80s, but to see the city it had become, I realized, and I talked to President Carter about it, I said, we can't do anything internationally if we're not willing to look in our own backyard. And so this program is a perfect example. Chicago, Washington, D.C., Atlanta are now working with you know, Nairobi, Guatemala City, We are all over, and I think when you sit the mayors down together and they have these conversations and they're able to communicate sometimes in five different languages going on, the information that's being shared is not one way. It's not from the cities back to Atlanta. It's actually from Atlanta to the cities, and so that's been very exciting for us. Thank you so very much. Um, and on the issue of a changing Atlanta and how much it changed over the last 10, 20 years, which must have been massive. I've been in Atlanta now a few times, but only in the last seven years, several times. So I can't look back as much, but I heard that it really changed massively. And one of those changes, um, it's certainly the belt, belt line. So um, this brings me to you. Yes, <laughs> yes. Tell us a little bit about how that came along um, and the planning process. And um, it's a beautiful way to engage the community But maybe you can also tell us the stumbling blocks which you faced and are still facing in the implementation. Yeah, that's a fair question. And so for our friends that are watching from Germany and from Los Angeles, the Beltline is perhaps the, the country's largest infrastructure reuse project and is right here uh, in Atlanta. I, I'm telling you, words are woefully inadequate to really describe this. You need to come and visit, put eyes on it, but I will try to, to give you some color uh, to this. But the Beltline, as we talk about community, that, that is the Beltline superpower. It started off because of community conversations. Started off with a, a thesis a statement from a graduate student from Georgia Tech, Ryan Gravel. How do we repurpose the abandoned railroad lines in the city of Atlanta and really remix, so think about what infrastructure did in this country in the 50s and 60s. It, it separated communities. And now we have an opportunity with the Beltline to bring communities back together using infrastructure. So I got a, a little, it's the teacher in me. So who knows the first name of the city of Atlanta? And this is for the folks in the audience. I'm going <laughs> to... I knew Anna, she, you know, she, she's that AP student that's going to raise her hand all the time. So, Terminus, yes, and for our folks in the audience, Terminus. So we were a railroad community. And so now we are repurposing these abandoned railroad lines into this essentially 22-mile loop greenway within the, the city of Atlanta that's going to have trail, transit, affordable housing, economic development, jobs, Parks, public art, it, it is a massive project there. And this felt perhaps like a nice to do when this first started. But if you think about what's going to happen in the next 25 to 26 years, and, and Anna knows this, but our metro is about to add almost 3 million people to, to Metro Atlanta. What, folks, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? But what, one of the things we can do is making sure that this belt line gets completed because what we're trying to do is create whole communities where people can access a grocery store, a medical facility, a place of employment, all the things that add to the quality of life. You'll be able to do that off of the belt line without necessarily having to get in a car. And but. We do not move the Beltline project without having, we, we don't chew gum without having a conversation with the community out there. And that really is our superpower. Now, we talk about all the, the great things about the Beltline. You know, there's $10 billion dollars of economic impact. It's been 25,000 jobs created along the Beltline. 
but that success has also caused some challenges on the affordable housing side. And luckily, we have an amazing mayor who really, you know, led the conversation about housing affordability in Atlanta, you know, many years ago. I'm happy to say that we're on a really good track right now. But but all cities, if if they don't know it yet, are going to have a challenge with with housing affordability as well. So also a follow-up question to you. Um, so the Beltline is not just a nice walkway where people can spend private time, engage in their communities, and have a nice time outside. It is more, right? You think about it more in terms of also city planning and getting the facilit facilities and services also to the communities where they need to be, so you're taking a more, much more comprehensive view. We are, we are. And so think about the, the Beltline. So the Beltline roughly is about 7,500 acres within the city of Atlanta. So roughly about 20% of the population in the city of Atlanta lives in roughly a half a mile uh, distance to, to the Beltline corridor. And it really is an open canvas. This is a place for us to really experiment within the city with regards to the zoning, uh, parking, housing, all of these difficult conversations that we want to, to have about city planning, we can experiment along the, the belt line. D do we really need to have the same parking ratios for facilities on the belt line? And, and the answer is no. We can experiment with that because that, that is one of the, the biggest challenges for housing affordability developers is those parking decks. It's very expensive. And so can we have development along the Beltline, I'll say this a little aggressively, that has zero parking? Why can't we? You should be able to live on the Beltline, walk to work, walk to a grocery store, walk to your child's educational facility. Again, all the things that you do for a good quality of life, you should be able to do on the Beltline. That requires experimentation and that's what we're doing around this 22 mile loop. And we are very excited. We're going to finish the, the trail network portion of this. We've raised about $350 million over the last two years. And so we're in a good place financially, but this is a place to experiment. And I really challenge uh, other cities to, to look at the Beltline. Obviously I'm very biased, but Vanessa knows this. We, 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 we host, uh, a delegation probably twice a month from another city, many internationally, just really trying to understand, like, what is the secret sauce to this glorified sidewalk? It's, it's, <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's a sidewalk. But it is where Atlanta comes together. We, we host millions and millions of people that walk on the Beltline on an annual uh, basis. And so and we track some of this data. Interestingly enough, 15% of the people that walk there are coming from the airport. So they land, and then they come straight to, to the belt line. So that should tell you something. And so, yes. And, and I'll say, I actually, when I moved here, we moved onto the belt line, and I ride my bike to work every day to the Carter Center. Uh, so, see, you know, I this because I moved from Amsterdam, and that was, I rode my that's bike. That's and how so we should live. Well, so, see? I'm not just making this up. No. <laughs> it really no. happened. No, 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 no. And we will definitely come back to the issue of, um, of the learning and if other cities are actually learning and how that whole learning process also is organized in the United States between cities. I think that is something also our international audience uh, will be very interested in, in hearing, um, also with regard to the somewhat political divisions um, in the country and um, it would be nice to hear how cities are overcoming this but before we do so i also want to bring in anna into the discussion now we focus a little bit more on the um on on, on the inner, inner city or the cities the inner cities but cities are not just cities they are also interacting with the region there's something around the cities um, and a lot of people are living outside the city maybe some are also pushed outside the inner city again to other parts of the larger urban area. Um, so how do we um, bring that together? Um, you know, the federal government had a lot of uh, foresight when they created uh, regional commissions. Um, I think because they understood 
that there are certain challenges that communities have uh, that can't be addressed within the confines of a city uh, or even a county. When you think about things like uh, the environment, uh, affordable housing, uh, transit, transportation, uh, those are things that you can't really solve within a city jurisdictional line because roads uh, cross jurisdictions, uh, homeless people migrate across jurisdictions. Um, <clears throat> so I think the creation of regional commissions uh, to implement long-range strategies in these uh, areas that communities tackle each and every day uh, was incredible insight on the part of the federal government uh, across the United States. Um, how do we do it? Uh, you know, the mission of the Atlanta Regional Commission uh, is to foster thriving communities for all through data-informed planning uh, and investments in communities across Metro Atlanta. Uh, and then our vision for the region is one great region. Uh, how do you do that? Is that we ensure that our mission and our vision is inclusive of everybody. Um, I've got communities within the Metro Atlanta region that could not be more different from each other. And so the conversations that we have as a regional commission are difficult conversations uh, because what affordability means for Metro Atlanta, for Ant Atla the city of Atlanta, is very different than what affordability means for Alpharetta or Johns Creek. Um, how they uh, desire to address um, climate change in Atlanta is very different than how they want to have the conversation about climate change in Coweta, right, or Forsyth County. And so we have very, very difficult conversations. The way to make them successful, though, um, is to focus on those things that weave common threads throughout all of our very, very diverse and distinct communities. And I think we've had a great deal of success doing that, focusing on the things that we can all agree on. Um, and, and so that's how we uh, plan long range, is to focus on those things that are common to all of us. We've got an incredible uh, amount of power and resources within the Atlanta Regional Commission. Over our 30-year plan, the federal government entrusts us with investing over $173 billion worth of transportation resources, and that's just transportation. If you add our workforce development resources, our aging resources, it's, it's a lot. Um, and so it, it, it's, it's not a drop in the bucket. And so if you're not having these conversations across these uh, different communities and coming up with solutions that address our common, uh, commonly agreed upon needs, uh, then, then that can't be successful. So I'm very grateful uh, for the responsibility that we have, but the way that we do it, I think, is focusing on things that are, uh, that's a common thread throughout all of these communities. I think both for our participants as well as for our viewers, it would be really informative to understand a little bit better how that engagement, stakeholder engagement process is really organized. Um, how do you do it? Well, number one, it's required. <laughs> so <laughs> that it really helps. You know, the, again, the federal government is very uh, um, intentional about the requirement for community engagement. Uh, and I think they understand and we agree that building uh, thriving communities uh, involves engaging with those communities. Um, and so, number one, the fact that it is required from our grantors that we engage the community is one motivating factor for us to make sure that we're doing it and we're doing it uh, well. I but if, if I may just briefly yes. cut in, because I think not everybody might be able to follow you. Sure. If you say, Federal government, you really mean Washington, That's which right. is really setting here the rules <laughs> for <laughs> things which are happening on a very local level. Um, who, who who made that? I mean, who does uh, is it executive, the White House, or yeah. is it Congress? Well, I think it, it definitely starts at the top with, with the president because he sets the agenda for the nation. But we're funded by the United States Department of Transportation uh, through... Uh, FTA as well as FHWA. And when we uh, receive those grant fundings to 
funding to invest in the community, part of that is this requirement that we engage with the community. Um, but it, it would be a mistake and it would be an injustice if we did uh, solely what the federal government required and we weren't thoughtful uh, about how we engage with our community. Someone made the comment before, I can't remember if it was you, Paige, about uh, the growth of uh, the, the uh, international population in Metro Atlanta. Now, we cannot say we're engaging for purposes of this access to these federal funds if we are not intentional about how we engage with those communities that speak a different language, that have a different level of trust in government, uh, and that have very diverse uh, needs uh, within their own smaller communities than Metro Atlanta. So I think that in order for community engagement to work, it needs to be intentional, it needs to be diverse, and it needs to be consistent. So we update our 30-year plan every four years, and we could, uh, in compliance with the federal government, only engage with the community every four years when that plan is being updated, right? But the consistency of that community uh, builds a level of trust between us uh, and our communities across Metro Atlanta that we can go to them every four years, right? Um, but we don't limit that engagement uh, just to that time frame. So community engagement is critical for us. It's a part of every single planning process that we have. And how we invest these funds is really about how the communities want uh, their own neighborhoods to grow, not how ARC wants their neighborhoods to grow. So Clyde, let's imagine you want to build another part of the Beltline. <laughs> yes. So you go to Vanessa and say, I want to build that part of the pi um, <laughs> <laughs> belt line. Um, you go to Anna and say, hey, let's do that uh, more regionally. Um, and where's the money for it? And seriously, how do you do it? No, it, 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 it they really get it from is. ARC. Yeah, they <laughs> and, we, and, you know, and Anna is, you know, that was tongue in cheek, but we actually do get significant funding from, uh, from ARC. And so it is a, so you know, Anna said something really uh, critical, um, CDT. So that is making sure how you engage with the community. Consistency, diversity, and, tra and transparency. And, and we do that not because we have to, but we do it because we want, it, it really makes the Beltline project a lot better. Bad policy is based in isolation. It goes fast but it's based in isolation and it turns into something that the community really doesn't want. And so we have to, we're mandated to go to the community and have these conversations, but we want to go to the community and have these conversations. And so we have four quarterly meetings a year, but if you look at all of our community engagement, matter of fact, community engagement is perhaps the largest department within the Beltline, if, if that tells you something. So we put our money where our mouth is. Community engagement is perhaps the largest department within the, the Beltline organization. We roughly have about 70 people. We manage about $150 million budget, but the bulk of our group is, is community engagement. And so we go out uh, on an annual basis 60 to 70 times a year to have conversations about the, the Beltline. Uh, anytime we get a new significant funding source in, we typically will put a stakeholder, uh, stakeholder advisory group together to give us feedback as well. And so we love to go to the community and have conversations. Sometimes it's difficult, it, it's challenging, but the end product ultimately is ultimately better belt line, better policy, and people feel engaged. And so when you hear about the belt line and for folks uh, in the, the audience, you oftentimes will hear all of these wonderful flowery announcements about Beltline. Beltline did this, or Beltline did that. But the engine behind that is because we went to the community and had some of those early, early conversations. And so when you see the end product, that's why everybody's smiling and happy about Beltline, because we did the hard work in the early days. And Vanessa, do you organize uh, town hall meetings where you get the general public um, on board, or is it more the organized stakeholders? So you're talking about the community resource events that we organize typically. So my team just actually sent me the stats. In the month of May, we did 11 community resource events and served 893 families. So it's not a town hall per se, but it's an opportunity for them to come in and feel safe. 
and feel comfortable and we speak their language or we have folks that speak their language and so they're able to let us know hey this is what is happening sometimes they're affected by gang related activity or this is what I saw I don't feel safe or for example another thing that I really learned and this is what is key about this job is having an open mind you're always learning the city seal when you look at the city seal it represents something to someone and it can represent something completely different to somebody else and so that's why our office is also known as welcoming Atlanta so if you look at the logo, if you look at the colors that are there, it's representing the various communities that we serve. So it's not a town hall per se, but certainly there's always an opportunity for them to hear directly from the Atlanta Police Department, the Atlanta Fire Rescue Department. It's an opportunity for them to have these conversations. And so that's what really has been key and bringing these external stakeholders as well. Just to do a little quick exercise in something that is very successful about the city of Atlanta in terms of the community engagement, but the diplomacy piece and the international engagement is, is that we take stock of what is taking place at City Hall. So our office actually has worked with every single city department. And I can say that <laughs> because every time we ask folks to raise their hand if they work with us, the whole room. The majority of the folks here, we've had the opportunity of working with them. So we take stock of what is happening at City Hall. We listen to the communities. We really put our, our boots on the ground. We listen and we're like, this is what they need and then we engage all the other partners as well. When I say partners, for example, the Goethe being here, Aspen Institute, Aspen, Germany, the various universities, educational institutions, government agencies, law firms, I mean, you name it, we work with them. And so we have an understanding that we are, if, if you will, just to have a visual, we're on top of a hill and we're able to see what everybody's doing. But not everybody's able to see what everybody's doing. So then if I see you are doing all this activity and you're doing the same exact activity, why don't we bring you all together to have this conversation? And it's the same thing on the global level. Is if Berlin is doing something that we see around affordable housing, because I know that's also a challenge as well, can we learn about that as well? For example, the um, food accessibility or the urban forest, how do we make sure that we can also engage communities that way? So we can learn Amsterdam, because you mentioned Amsterdam as well. I've gone there, financial technology, smart cities innovation, educational, not upskilling, but reskilling the current workforce. There's so many different ways that we can tap and grow into that. So that is what is key is, and the city of Atlanta is really collaboration, data is key. We get a lot of our information actually from ARC, so thank you very much. And engaging in projects, because oftentimes what happens is people are trying to recreate the wheel over and over and over and over again. Whereas you don't need to recreate it because it's already happening. Just because you don't hear about it doesn't mean it's not taking place. So we're making sure that we're providing a voice for these organizations that have these ideas that we can implement. So it's not a town hall, but it's a way for us to constantly have these conversations on a weekly basis with everybody that we serve, including the consulates as well. And uh, Paige, you talked a lot about uh, information and information sharing. How do you do it? Uh, well, the, because we we do a proposal, <coughs> excuse me, we, we do an application out to cities to see if people want to be part of this Inform Women, Transform Lives campaign. And because we now have 24 cities and we're going into our third cohort, so we hope to have another 12, it's, it's that dialogue that we have to have with the mayor's office because – by 2050, 70% of the world's population are going to live in cities. And so cities' ability to, be res to, to respond to the citizens' needs are what builds that trust. And so these offices, and especially the mayor's office, I mean, Vanessa knew early on, they have these municipal programs. They're just not reaching the people that they need to reach. And so that's the conversations that we have. We bring people together in town hall settings. We, you know, it's, it, youth are not homogeneous. Let's be clear, I have a Gen Z who actually worked with Vanessa. So <laughs> she met him at another event at the Dutch consulate and said, you know, I want to bring youth in. But I can tell you at my dinner table, having a conversation with youth is very different than sort of how I see things. And the same thing go with, you know, my daughters who are grown. From a women's perspective, they feel very differently. So having that transparency and having that conversation to figure out what is going to affect change, what is it that they all want to hear? Because the reason people are so excited about the Beltline initiatives are because they have been part of it. And that's when we have a problem. You know, we're, we're in Liberia, 63% of the population in Liberia is below the age of 25. 
and we had a group of like motorcycle gangs and groups that 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 youth were not effective we brought them together and we had conversations with them to make them sort of buy you know to, to educate them as to what the city was offering and to buy into it in a way that then they actually had a very respectful way of approaching some of these issues. So whereas they had previously been shunned, it helped legitimize them and it validated their role in society. And that's what a lot of our programs are about, are validating uh, underserved populations' role as to how they can be part of any of these initiatives. Um, I also wanted to touch upon uh, the issue of city learning between cities. <laughs> So how is this organized um, in the United States? I can, I can start. But I, I, I did want to put a fine point on something that was amplified across this panel, but I, I do need to put a fine point on it. Um, Clyde used the term, we take it to the community, and I, I think you understate it a little bit. If you are doing community engagement from your office, rethink whether you can call that community engagement you have to get out of the office and into the community. So I would encourage anybody who is listening in Los Angeles or, or wherever else we are streaming to think about if, you, if you're responsible for engaging the community and you are doing it by sending out a survey via email or by the, not that those things can't be effective, but your community engagement plan has to involve you leaving the office and going uh, to these communities because you will miss a whole swath of people uh, just using that strategy. Uh, now your second question <laughs> was, I just, I, ha I had to reiterate that point because it's very important. It's very, it's really it, it important. is absolutely um, important. Mm -hmm. uh, and my second question was, how do you take the, the, the good learnings from yep. one city to, to the other, how that is organized? <laughs> so fortunately, the way that the Atlanta Regional Commission is structured, we are a convener of cities and counties. And so our, our, our basic framework is to pull uh, leadership from cities as well as counties across our 20 county region and make them talk to each other. Um, and so we generate uh, the discussion questions. Uh, we develop an agenda based on the things that they need to approve in order to move this region forward. But that's our DNA. That is what we were created to do is to pull together leadership from uh, cities and counties and, and force them to have conversations about things that thread our community together. So I think our basic framework uh, accomplishes that, but we do look to our partners um, to support the rest of the work that we have to do to connect to communities. And if I can add, platforms such as this one are very helpful. We've also, for example, done one, and Paige actually spoke, um, the mayor is part of the Truman Center City and State Diplomacy Task Force. He had the opportunity to actually, based on that, we did a provide a recommendation on what we would like to see in terms of city engagement on the federal level and we were able to get a special representative that oversees city and state diplomacy. And so now our voices are being heard, and not just that, but they launched the very first city summit. So there's the Summit of the Americas, they did the city summit. I actually had the opportunity with the Carter Center to have a conversation around gender-based violence, but there were so many different conversations that were taking place there, and that actually was led by the special representative. And so we are being able to have more of these opportunities where everybody comes to the table and talks about that. But also as an office, we have been part of various networks, including uh, subnational diplomacy with the USC. We've been part of the German Marshall Fund. So we are having conversations with other offices that do similar work that we do. So not only the international affairs side, but the immigrant affairs side. So having these opportunities to have these conversations, and if maybe every two months, there's actually roundtable discussions. During the pandemic, we, we actually pitched it to USC and said, I would love to hear what other cities are doing in terms of economic recovery, in terms of engaging our communities. And we started having these on a monthly basis, and they stuck in a good way. But sometimes I think that we're not discussing here is bandwidth limitations. Oftentimes people think, can you do this, can you do that, can you go here, can you go there? No. <laughs> Would I like to? Yes. But there's different ways, and that's what we're doing as an office as we're growing, is prioritizing and streamlining. So for example, trade, for the second year in a row, the state of Georgia has had um, now $196 billion worth of trade. 
Germany being number two in terms of facility and employment. That is an important relationship to have. And when we're talking with all the other economic development partners, we always talk about fintech, health IT, mobility, logistics, supply chain management. But it is also my job to support by providing information about these various programs, but not get short-sighted where I don't start looking at what other programs could be coming up or what other industries that we're not looking into. Food industry, for example. Food entrepreneurship is something that is coming up. So it's by hearing from these various cities, including at the Info Women Transform Lives campaign, I learned about engaging the elders in the community. And so I thought that was key and also about optimizing the website, the page that we had. I started making calls in the various services that the city had. The lines were off, the email wasn't working, and it was, and now it's improved a lot more because of these partnerships that we have been having. So building these types of platforms, so thank you Stormy and to your team, this is what really makes a difference. And uh, we are certainly happy to do so. Um, before I hand over to you, um, just on, on again on the issue of, of learning, um, the job of a mayor is a really big job, right? Very challenging. Um, huge expectations, lots of stakeholders, lots of engagement, being ve pretty close to the people, um, hearing their concerns, then the implementation. Um, I think your mayor is lucky because you have such a vibrant city and a great team to support him. But there are also so many mid-sized and smaller cities in the United States, but also in Germany, um, where the mayor might not be so lucky, m maybe less experienced, maybe also have a less experienced team, um, maybe also less resources. Are there any programs um, for these kinds of mayors to help them step up and uh, utilize all the potential which there is? So if it's okay, <laughs> I'll take a quick stab at this question. During the City Summit of the Americas, we did a debriefing afterwards. And I did mention that it is great for us to hear about what other cities are doing, but what about creating some sort of blueprint or some sort of mechanism for cities that are interested, that don't have the budget, that don't have the bandwidth, can start somewhere. So I'm not saying you have to roll and start doing sports diplomacy, natu naturalization, econ all these different, you don't have to. Because all the cities are different. And oftentimes we're like, well, you know, New York and Chicago and San Francisco. We're not New York, we're not San Francisco, we're not Chicago, we're not LA, and they're not Atlanta. So I think that is always very important for us to stay true to what the DNA of the city is. And so there are programs that are gonna be coming up in the pipeline, hopefully, being led by the federal government to provide that opportunity. But I always say I'm not territorial. Sometimes we have other cities that reach out and say, hey, can you talk about what y'all are doing within the region? I'm like, absolutely. Three hours away, sure. Because at the end of the day is, as long as we're all working together and it's the same goal, we're gonna be able to achieve it much faster if we all share the tools and outward them. I think, the, I think that they are national resources for cities to connect. The National League of Cities, I think it's a fantastic resource and they have gone global um, to some degree. So there, there are resources that uh, capture best practices for, for cities, but speaking of the mayor, I mean, it, whether you have the resources or not, an engaged mayor is critical to a thriving city. I want to say that the mayor is on all of our boards in one way or the other. The mayor's on my board, the mayor's, and, and he, he doesn't miss a meeting. He shows up, he's there, he's a part of the conversation because he understands the impact of regionalism on the city of Atlanta. He understands how important it is for him to have a, a, a maintain a relationship and be a part of the conversation with surrounding cities. And so this mayor showing leadership in that way is something very simple that you don't have to be a mayor of a well-resourced city to do. You can start by showing up. You can start by being a part of that conversation. And, and I, I, I mean, I could not have been uh, uh, the leader of the Atlanta Regional Commission at a better time when we have this mayor being as involved as he is. I agree. He shows up um, ad infinitum. Our, our mayor is everywhere. That 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 is his currency. He will tell you that is is energy. He shows up. He sits on my board. He's on just a number of boards out there. And so so that is really great. And I also want to to talk about what Anna said. The National Leagues of Cities is actually going to host their their next annual meeting in Atlanta. So that's just a plug. If you ever want to learn 
uh, more about our city. But from from an access to information perspective, for us, these forums help. Uh, we belong to a number of trade and affinity groups just across the country, some that are international. You know, that's obviously an opportunity to get access to, to resource. But it's interesting, you know, the, the Beltline, in this infrastructure reuse space, uh, w we are, and, and again, this is going to sound a little boastful, but, but we are really a leader in this space. You know, probably every other city in the country right now is looking at the Beltline and how do you do X, how do you do Y. And so we feel this pressure, not only from a city perspective, but just from an international perspective, because everyone is looking at us, okay, well, what is the Beltline doing with regards to, to X or Y or Z? And, and it's interesting, the, the peer pressure that is taking place amongst, I would say, green space initiatives across the country is so, so interesting. So it, organizations and projects that started off as pure green space, like, hey, we're going to develop a massive park or a new trail or a new park or a new plaza. The days of those organizations and projects thinking that they're just there simply to develop green space in isolation are gone, are absolutely gone. So there's this massive shift in my sector of understanding that, hey, we thought we were urban planners for, for parks, but now we have to get really intelligent about affordable housing. We got to get really smart about economic development, about workforce development, these really important adjacency topics that, you know, green space developers weren't necessarily conversant at. I, I will take this statement and, again, it, it's really a, it's not a pejorative, it's actually a good statement, but my friend who was the founder of the High Line in New York City, and many of you heard that, and, and unfortunately, you know, a reporter called him and said, oh, Robbie, what do you think about the High? He said that the High Line was one of the, the, the great failures in New York City. And so they took that statement and said, oh, you know, Robbie says the High Line was, no, he wasn't saying that. What he was saying is that the High Line missed an opportunity to buy adjacent land next to the High Line, next to the infrastructure for future affordability and other things that they should be doing from a community development perspective. But no one, if we're being honest, if they were developing green projects, infrastructure projects in the 90s or the early 2000s, they weren't thinking about community development. And that's where I have to give you know my hats off to the, the framers, the visionaries behind the Beltline to make sure that we were not just a green space development project, but how do you really create jobs? How do you impact affordable housing, future transit? Making sure that everyone is winning because of the Beltline investment. That's my phrase for, for equity. Making sure that everybody is winning. Yeah, and I would say, you know, every city has its own challenges. And Atlanta had this, you know, opportunity with the railroad to actually figure out what was next and what it could do to bring people back into the city. And so that that was a challenge that, that Atlanta took on, but it, it took it on because of staffing. And so you can have a wonderful mayor, but if you don't have people like Vanessa and others who are willing to reach out and be part of the community, you know, here in Atlanta – I'll say we've got the Carter Center, we have CARE, we have you know two really big international development organizations that are present here. And we bring people in. I, in November, we're going to have the Human Rights Defenders Forum. You know, my, my boss was a Nobel Peace Prize winner, Martin Luther King, Nobel Peace Prize winner. Atlanta has a lot to offer, and therefore people come here. What lessons can be taught? What lessons can be learned in those exchanges? And so a lot of that is what's over the horizon while making sure you recognize historically what's important because we need to build on those legends of the information that we have and make sure that we continue to look and recognize the importance of human rights, the importance of engagement, transparency, diversity. All of that is part of building a cooperative city that is not just looking at the immediacy of economic development now, but what is going to further us uh, both in our historical baggage that we have and how we come to terms with it and how we move forward in a proactive way that brings people back. So, 
And with this, I would like to open the conversation. There are still some open seats here as well. If you don't want to stand the whole time, I feel sorry for you that you have to stay. Um, the, the benefit is that you can go in and out and get a coffee and a <laughs> snack, but the benefit of here is sitting down. So if you want to come up, you're certainly very welcome. Um, and please always say your name. And <laughs> and Philip is going to come back in and also help with the mics. Um, I only need in. one mic. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Dorothy Beasley. And something that Vanessa said struck me, and then I want to ask another question. And that is, she said, uh, engaging the elders. Well, from the color of my hair, you can tell <laughs> I'm one of them. But when you talk about coming out into the community, don't forget they're organized into living communities already. You just have to show up. I'm at Lenbrook, across the street, there's Canterbury Court, there's Renaissance, there's a whole lot of them. And we are a growing part of the community numbers wise. You know, older people are getting more and more of us. <laughs> uh, and so I, I think in, in your group you're planning, plus I do think some of us bring a little bit of wisdom, at least some of them, let us say, do that. The other side of the coin is we say in, in what was promoted uh, to come to this that um, cities need to engage the young generation in decision making early. I'm talking about youth empowerment. Well, you know, that really has to start with something that we are missing in our education system, and that is the teaching of civics. Unless they know what citizenship is, their responsibility as citizens, and what government is about, and how they're part of it, they don't really even know about we the people. And so one of the things we've been trying to do in some of our systems, and it's not statewide yet, is the bar, so the uh, Georgia bar started this, but we are not continuing now, we need another vehicle, is a course called iCivics, Internet Civics, that Justice Sandra Day O'Connor started. And the children learn about civics and citizenship by games. It's free, it's online, and one of the games I like, and you like this one too, is the kids in your neighborhood don't have a park. They have no place to put, how do you get a park? So in the little game thing, <laughs> they go down, go down to City Hall, to the, and you, you don't start here. You have to start in your neighborhood. And then where's the money gonna come from? And where's the property? And making those decisions. And the children then learn how local government works. So I highly promote that for our school systems. And those of you who have influence there, go. Thank you so much. Um, we will collect a few comments and then turn it back. And, and I also want to encourage our um, uh, online audience to also send in questions. Philip, that is possible, right? And could you read those questions which come in? Okay, wonderful. But I saw another hand coming up and then I hand over to the gentleman in the fourth row. Thank you so much, uh, Regina Shi from uh, both Emory and Rand Corporation. This is a brilliant panel. Thank you so much. I have a question that I wrote down. Um, and it's about youth empowerment and data access. Um, we talked this morning during the workshop about power and data. And as you know, Atlanta has an open data portal run by the city of planning. But open data portals are not just for city planners, they're for citizens. And if we talk about um, civic engagement, um, we need better data portals that facilitate uptake and analysis and interpretation of the data. Um, and so the things that I wanted to mention are that open data city, city open data portals across the country differ very much. And Rand did a study on open data portals. Um, in the early days of the pandemic, did you know that some open city data portals showed that domestic violence calls from nine for 911 declined? When we were all in lockdown and relationships were strengthened and strained, do we really believe that domestic violence calls declined? So when we talk about the quality of data, I'm curious your perspectives on how you put together a data enterprise for the city of Atlanta that takes advantage of things like transportation services, green space utilization, healthcare, um, social services, and understanding access gaps and unmet needs in real time because many times these data sources are not put out with a very quick time horizon. Um, and the categories of data are not linked together. So parking occupancy, food access, um, that facilitate rapid data analysis. So I'm curious your perspectives. It sounds aspirational and pie in the sky, but we need better data and faster data to help with um, meeting the needs of citizens and also making sure that 
misinformation, which is where the seeds of extremism start, do not um, you know, <laughs> get exacerbated through bad, bad quality data. Hi, my name is Samson um, Adote. I'm a newcomer in Atlanta. I've been here barely a year, and I'm happy to call Atlanta my home because my wife was born here, but um, my daughter was also born here. Um, I'm originally from Ghana, and I just, you know, whilst listening to you, I was really synthesizing everything you said, and I want to share an experience from Ghana. So in Ghana, we have something called the National Youth Parliament, and it's a way that different uh, municipal assemblies or districts um, and metropolitan assemblies engage with young people. Um, I don't know if we have an equivalent of that here um, in the US, but that's like an example that I feel if other cities could learn from, it could be very useful in ensuring that you have like a, a very good pipeline of young people actively involved in designing cities, um, and not just young people between 18 to 35, but also like younger people below the ages of 18. So just like um, the lady over there said, um, it's important to involve young people, especially teenagers and like toddlers in designing future cities because 20 years, 30 years from now, none of us will be here. Um, and if we're designing for ourselves, <laughs> You know, um, he knows something we don't know. You know, <laughs> you never know. I mean, none of us knew about COVID, right? So, um, whilst designing cities, we need to be very intentional, inclusive, um, and also ready to get to the bottom or the, the, the bottom of the pyramid or the, yeah, to, you know, really involve everybody, including. And people like myself who are newcomers in, in a city like Atlanta in designing these cities. Um, and I think whilst we're doing this, we also need to be very cognizant of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Because often when we're doing all this very important work, um, we tend to forget about that. And, um, you know, just to finish my statement, um, in the past 10 years, I have been working with a global nonprofit. Um, that works in Africa and is focused on connecting science to humanity. And I can tell you it, it was one of the most difficult things to do, where people don't have faith and trust in science. How do you get them to trust science? How do you get them to come out to want to engage with science? And how do you get them to sort of work with you to design the scientific future of a continent that for a very long time nobody really thought anything good could come out of that continent? So. I think involving young people is important, but also creating spaces where they can be on civic engagement or learning civics, creating spaces where they can actually do the things that they learn from that civics class is very important. Philip, do we have any anybody online? Well, no, no. Any? Hi, my name is Lauren Clark. I'm a native Atlantan. <laughs> Not many people can say that these days. <laughs> um, I'm a writer, editor, and journalist. And uh, my question pertains to, um, though it was briefly mentioned a little bit, not too much in detail, when we talk about the design of urban cities and all the technology and the future of urban cities is taking place, one of the big things that first came to me when we in the context of crime was the issue of human trafficking. And um, there are a lot of efforts, initiatives that have been made, and in addition to uh, missing children, missing girls and boys. And um, I wanted to know, have there been any prominent conversations which have recently taken place that are addressing how the design of these cities are strategically being used to cut down or to cut the percentage of human trafficking activity that is happening in the city? In addition, that it's being used to cut down on these increasing incidents of missing children in the city and in the outskirts of the city. Um, I know specifically there's been an increase of um, young black American teenage girls that's increased with missing girls being taken. And so I wanted to know how, um, have there any, been any conversations, any new conversations that are taking place and any possible ideas that have been proposed? Thank you. Thank you so much. And with this, I uh, hand it back um, to our panelists. Um, and um, really, really big questions, really important issues. Um, who would like to go first? 
I mean, I took notes because <laughs> it was a fair amount. So maybe I can start and then we can just kind of work our way up. So very quickly, Ghana. I don't know if you know about my colleague, Valerie Mills. You want to say hi? She's from Ghana. And we actually partner a lot with the Ghana International Chamber of Commerce. We just did an event with the Children's Museum where Matilda came out and she spoke and she talked about the culture. We also had folks from Pakistan that came. We had Goethe that came as well. Because we agree with you all, it has to start from a very, very early age. And in terms of human rights, if we can understand, if we can learn more from one another, then we are going to respect each other more and want to learn more from one another. So I just wanted to touch on that real quick. And we are working on creating a youth ambassadors program. So we don't have a national youth parliament, but certainly starting with having youth ambassadors that represent the diversity in our city. And also our native Atlantans, I think it's always great to also have that perspective. So I just wanted to mention that uh, connecting science to community, what we've learned in the past is food. You know, food, but also making it not only informative, but entertaining. So we will bring people to do performances or showcase what science could do, for example. That's something that you could do. I don't know if anybody else wants to talk about Ghana, but, <laughs> but so there's a few other I things. I I'll, I'll piggyback on what, what you, you mentioned and, and perhaps touch on something that you didn't. Um, we've got uh, pretty significant data analytics and predictive analytics capacity within ARC. We also have an open data portal. Uh, prior to taking on this role as the CEO for ARC, I was the chief operating officer for Fulton County Government. And we were in the beginning stages of understanding open data, trying to figure out uh, what to make available to the public as we were trying to uh, correct and improve things internally because the data you put out is only as good as what you put in, right? Let me ask this. Uh, governments are uh, late to the party. And so I think what we ought to honestly ask is for a little uh, bit of patience with government because I do believe for every government that I've interacted with and uh, worked as an executive for, they are trying. They are trying to make the information more available and more transparent. They are they are later than the private sector in understanding open data and, 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 and trying to figure out how to make it available, but keep the pressure on uh, because it's important to an informed society that that data becomes available, um, but keep encouraging your governments to do a little bit more than they are. They're getting into that space, just they, they need a little, a little bit more time. In terms of getting students engaged, um, we run a model Atlanta Regional Commission at ARC. It, it's, and we bring in high school students who go through our commission process. It's a year-long process. I love the idea. I think, and I think most governments do something similar. I think the issue is scale. Um, every year we bring about 20 students through that program. That's 20 out of hundreds of thousands in Metro Atlanta. So I do love the idea. We just have to figure out how to scale it. I do think governments are doing it. I think quasi-governments like my own agency, I think we're doing it. It's just a matter of how do we get more kids uh, involved? How do we do it 10x what we're doing uh, right right now? So uh, uh, those, were, those were my, oh, I do have one other comment about youth engagement. What I have learned in interacting with Metro Atlanta communities and, and seeing that also all across the country is that the youth uh, are engaged. They know exactly what they want. They may not be engaging the way we want them to, and yes, they need to learn civics as a, as a former lawyer, I think it's important, um, but they're really driving the conversations that we are having. Governments are late to the party uh, and we are bureaucratic the way we are designed. It's not designed to answer the questions in the way young people want them to be answered. So for me, I think a lot of energy needs to go into how we rethink our delivery of service to young people uh, because they are engaged and they are driving the conversations and they are uh, entrepreneurial in their thinking. Um, so they're speaking up. They may not be doing it in the traditional ways, but they are driving a lot of the things that you are seeing uh, being demanded of governments all across the United States and all across the globe. We just have to listen differently, and we have to be willing to change our um, 
framework as governments and, and as foundations and service deliverers to respond to their needs because they're talking. We just got to listen. Before I hand over to the two of you, um, there was an online question which I also want to throw at you. So, Philip. <laughs> sure. Should I go? Okay. Um, so we have a question by Tinjeria Willis, and she asks, you've mentioned experimentation. Textile waste is detrimental to communities and a big part of carbon emissions as well as water pollution. Are there plans to include textile waste solutions and engagement into your planning and programming? Oh, now it gets specific, huh? <laughs> Hi, Tanduria. So I know Tanduria. She was actually part of the Women Export University and one of the, the first or second, she's probably laughing right now, first cohort for the Women's Entrepreneurship Initiative. And actually, she's had the opportunity in the past to partner with the Dutch Consulate for a Sustainable Fashion Week, which took place upon City Market. So in terms of the sustainability piece, waste management, that is certainly something that the city is interested in and continuing to pursue. But also, how do we continue to engage the community to bring that awareness and the various corporations that are unfortunately leading the charge in terms of all of this waste that is being found. So, I got that. Thank you. Well, I, I, I can link a few of these comments together from Dorothy Beasley and others. Uh, iCivics is wonderful and what the Bar Association is doing. It's one of the things that we realized, again, as an internationally focused NGO, but here in Atlanta, when the elections hit, and I'm not going to get po political, we're nonpartisan, but when the elections hit, it made us realize that people didn't understand what to expect. I mean, we expected the results that night. And so we knew ahead of time that we had to do education of people so they understood how the ballots were counted, how you know a risk limiting audit was done, how this was going to work. So education is a really big part of that. Along that line, when you're talking about data, you know, there's the digital world is out there and it is creating its own echo chamber. And so how do you plug into that? And cities need to understand what people are saying because it's a precursor for what's going to happen. And it, I'll give you an example, one of the programs we work on with the city of Atlanta, with the fire chief here in Atlanta, we assume that if people who were you know, missing or if there was domestic violence or there was abuse, someone would go to a police station. But there are limited police stations in Atlanta. There are more fire stations. There are 36 fire stations in Atlanta. So we partner now with the fire stations and create these safe spots. Uh, they're doing a high five back there. <laughs> We create uh, safe spots, and so when if someone shows up at a fire station, they shut it down. If a woman shows up, or someone, or a child shows up, and they're in, you know, uh, there's a stressful situation, they just shut down the station. The fire station next door is going to have to go and put out that next fire until they get the city services that are going to address the need. Now, of course, we thought. The fire stations in you know, one part of the city were going to be the ones that were going to see all the traffic. We didn't have the data. Turns out it was in Buckhead. It was not in the part of town we expected because we started doing a data scrub to figure out how many times this happened. So that you know, these are lessons that are learned from the community that teach us and that we then take to the next space. And this is, you know, we see this now in Michigan. We see this in, you know, the programs that we run in Sudan and Mali for conflict resolution, we're running in Ocala, Florida now. These are the conversations that you have to have globally so you can bring them locally and you can learn from them. Uh, so, But data is a really big piece of it. And education dot is a huge piece of it as well to protect the people that you're talking about in terms of giving them a safe space to go. So I think these are all lessons that get learned as we connect, as Vanessa sits at the top of the hill and looks down and sees where everybody is and understands how to make these connections. This is one of them. Yeah, for, for Beltline, again, we, we are an, a very interesting animal, if you will. It, we're all about being unorthodox. And so, the, you know, this is the, the year of the youth. The mayor has kind of proclaimed that. And so we will use different delivery methods to really engage young people in the city of Atlanta. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had what we describe as the Beltline Bike Fest with a local radio personality. 
And so we essentially gave kids free bicycles. And so in their mind, like, hey, I'm going to come out to the Beltline or Beltline Park. I'm going to get this bicycle. But that is just a furtive way for us to then engage these young people to really talk about, you know, this is your city at work. This is how this happened. And so, again, we're very non-traditional in that way. And with regards to, to the data side, we've actually partnered with, with Anna's organization on something called Neighborhood Nexus. And so we ha hear a lot of information about Beltline and Beltline neighborhoods changing. And so I think people feel that. I think sometimes they, can, they, they see that. But what is the data really suggesting with regards to, to our neighborhoods? And a lot of this is repopulation of neighborhoods that were, you know, challenged through some of the financial cycles. And so what you see, at least according to some of the early data, is a repopulation. But that's what the Beltline does, and it's, you know, literally on our website, very transparent. And we want to make sure, again, that as we make investments in the Beltline, we've put about $700 million into the project to date. We want to make sure that those 45 neighborhoods surrounding the Beltline we want to make sure that traditionally marginalized communities are getting their benefits as the Beltline is being developed. And then from a safety and security perspective, this is very new. We haven't really talked about this uh, in a grand scale, um, but we are piloting a smart city strategy around the Beltline that will have a big focus around safety and security. And so that means data collection, uh, cameras, all the things that you can think about from a technology perspective, you know, how can we deploy these cutting edge technologies for some of the very things that you are making reference to, but just on a broader scale. So even uh, just beyond the things that you're talking about, but how can we make the Beltline a very smart corridor? Because that, that, that's one of the things that keeps me up is future proofing the Beltline. Like, Okay, it, it's cool today, but I want it to be cool f in 2050 as well. And so what, what is that, Paige? Yeah, when we're all, th thank you. I set it up, see, Paige, you read me, thank you. We're still all around. <laughs> that was, we did not practice that, I promise, that, but that was great. But, um, but yeah, th those are just a couple of thoughts from, from Beltline. Can I say one more thing about the, the, the aging? I mean, it is important for us to engage the youth and listen to them, but uh, we have responsibility for tracking population estimates at the Atlanta Regional Commission. And what our forecasts are telling us is that by 2050, one in four individuals uh, will be over the age of 60. Okay, so we've got a growing aging population We've also got less migration from other areas to Metro Atlanta, so we should be listening to our youth, but we should, with the other ear, be listening to our aging population as well. Thank you very, very much. Unfortunately, we are already coming to an end of this wonderful discussion, but I want to do one last fast round. And um, I want to ask each of you, what keeps you up at night in a negative way, and what makes you hopeful when you wake up? <laughs> hey, we and, start and with you. <laughs> wow, and that's the fast round. We should have started off with that question <laughs> in the beginning. Ooh, that, that's heavy. Uh, so, so for, for me, it, it is this, this population influx that, you know, if we're going to essentially add another 3 million people, I, I think I, I read that's essentially the, the equivalent of the Denver Metro moving to Atlanta in the next 27 years. Again, I, that, that gives me heartburn about what we're going to do as a city, and it can't just be an Atlanta or city of Atlanta challenge. That's got to be the other cities, the other counties around us all collectively thinking about how we're going to give people options to get around the city. The Beltline is definitely going to give people options, but it's got to be bigger than, than the Beltline. So that, that, is, that is keeping me uh, up at, at night. Um, the thing that I'm very positive about is that the, the funding uh, options that we have from a city of Atlanta perspective, again, I think I mentioned it earlier, we've raised – uh, in partnership with a number of philanthropic federal, state, uh, local resources, uh, about $350 million. And so we're going to finish the, the belt. I'm, I'm super uh, excited about that. And then also how do we leverage that for, for future funding? We've 
we have such great partners. That probably warms my heart is uh, although Beltline, we're the quarterback for the project, but it's so many entities that touch the Beltline, the city, the county, the state. Um, I mean, not-for-profit entities really, really push this project forward, and that's why we're in such – these are the golden years for, for Beltline. So very quickly, for me it is asylum seekers. So as the office merge, it's whether or not we're going to have enough funding to be able to support the community-based organizations. And so oftentimes looking at the data has been shared by community-based organizations. It is babies, children, some folks that arrive without any shoes or folks that don't know their rights. So it goes back to human trafficking. Are these folks going to be safe when they arrive here? And are they going to be able to build a future? So that keeps me up. I sleep a little better because we did get $6.9 million of FEMA funding to be able to support with this initiative. And it's something that we work really hard on. And I'm very appreciative for all the work that is being done by the team and, again, reaching out to the communities. So that keeps me up at night. What keeps me looking forward is the leadership that we have currently, as Anna, as Clyde, as everybody has said, as Paige has said here, we have an incredible mayor, a mayor that is a tech mayor, so he's very focused on data collection, on improving, a mayor that doesn't seem to sleep, which is good <laughs> and bad for some of us. But it's constantly out there advocating for the city, advocating for the communities. And as I mentioned, I've worked for three administrations, and I haven't seen an administration like this one that really hit the ground running from day one, and particularly around global initiatives. He wanted to be part of the task force within the third month of his administration, which is something that I hadn't seen before. So I think, I think the thing that keeps me up is one that is so much bigger than the Atlanta Regional Commission. It is where we have gotten as a society where uh, conversation is hard. Um, I'm, in the, I'm in the community building business, and it's so very difficult to build communities when people are so at odds with each other. And unfortunately, I don't know what the solution is, and I don't know uh, when and whether as a society we're going to turn the corner to where we have the ability as individuals to talk with people who are different from us and who have different ideas and different values. Um, but that the lack of conversation uh, across uh, that spectrum very, very, very much concerns me because I'm worried about what it will ultimately do to communities and whether or not we need to redefine communities because people are talking. They're just doing it on the internet. They're doing it via text. I mean, is that our new community? Um, so that is something that keeps me up at night. It's, it's tangentially related to my job, but it's something that I, I do worry about because I've got four little people. I have four children, and I worry about, about their future in that regard. What, what does have me encouraged, though, is this new conversation that we, are, we find ourselves having globally about the climate and the need to protect it. Um, what encourages me is an administration like we have at the federal government that is willing to put their money where their mouth is when it comes to doing something uh, for the environment, Some making real investments to make us more resilient um, as a country and, and, and certainly as, as a globe. So you think about all of the climate initiatives and the bipartisan infrastructure law that is real money that is coming to real communities to make a real difference and then doubling down on that in the Inflation Reduction Act as well. So I'm very, very encouraged that we're having the climate conversation and that we're funding initiatives that will ultimately make a difference in the future. Right. My, mine are a bit personal in terms of uh, I have 3,000 staff people overseas and we work in very hard places. So I worry about my staff uh, every single day. <coughs> I think what, what pleases me and what I'm excited about is that we have learned lessons post-COVID. Having lived in Europe where there was a work-life balance, that was not necessarily the American way. And so, you know, yes, would I like to have all of my staff coming to the office every day, sure, but I also know that that's not reasonable anymore. And I am happy that people are able to take a mental health sort of check and recognize that you need to, you, know, you, you don't live to work, you know, and there's, it's okay to work 
so you can live, but you really do have to prioritize that balance. And so that makes me hopeful that people are suddenly, you know, we dis destigmatize mental health in a way that Mrs. Carter has spent 50 years talking about that, and everyone can have open conversations now. We have Health Parity Act passed here in Georgia. We are in a place where people can start taking care of themselves, and I think that will make us a better society writ large. Thank you very much. And with us, give them a big, big applause. <laughs> and this, this concludes our session. Thank you so much to everybody who and made thank this. You, and thank you for being yeah. such a great oh. yes, moderator. Um, I, I want to do one very important thing last, though. We, would, we all wouldn't be here today and in this project without Philip. So he really needs a big, big applause. <laughs> so thank you very much. There are still a few snacks and drinks out there. So enjoy the, um, the connecting and the networking. And uh, join us again um, at the Aspen Institute here in the United States or over on the other side of the Atlantic. In Florida.